what I want to look at tonight specifically was this concept of inventory. And inventory, I got to say that my experience with small business and business in general is that inventory causes a conundrum. It causes a conundrum because you need, as a business, you need a certain amount of inventory to allow you to do your work. So if you're a carpenter, for example, you want to have an inventory of two by four. Okay, because you're using two by four a bit. You don't want to be going to the store all the time. You know, I know, for example, if I go to Kent, it's an hour. Okay, it kills an hour to go buy one piece of two by four or 20 pieces of two by four. It's still an hour. I got to go up, get it, bring it home, that sort of thing. If I have some two by four here, I can do what I need to do because I'm not building much that, that, that is that big. I can do what I do very quickly. So the conundrum, though, is that if I have lots of two by four in stock, you know, I, that's great. I can save a lot of time. I don't have to go to Kent. I don't have to do that sort of thing. I have some here. I can get the project done. Way to go. But I have that two by four sitting under the snow or I have it out in my garage taking up space or I lose a piece or I cut a piece up or someone comes and takes a piece or these sorts of things. So all kinds of wonderful stuff can happen in inventory when I have it on my person. And any loss is my loss. So inventory, we got to strike a balance because of this conundrum. We need some, but we don't want so much that it costs us so much in terms of storing it, insuring it, taking care of it, these sorts of things. So we got to strike a balance between going to the store or having some of it stored in our shed. We got to strike that balance. And also, inventory tends to be expensive depending on what you're doing. You know, if you're in the electrician trade, for example, you got um, a bunch of um, circuit breakers. Okay. These circuit breakers are not cheap. You need a bunch of them, and there's different kinds of circuit breakers. So here you got a whole stock full of different circuit breakers. Uh, you probably got several thousand dollars worth of inventory there in circuit breakers alone. How fast will you go through that? Some you might go through a bit. Others you might have on the shelf gathering dust for years. They might become obsolete. That's the challenge that you have. You, you want to have it close at hand, but on the other hand, there's a price to that. So that's, that's what we're dealing with tonight is this issue of inventory and finding that magic balance. So inventory comes really in two forms, okay? It's the stuff that's available for sale. The picture I have here is an example of the stuff that's available for sale. It is those circuit breakers that I just talked about. There they are in a shelf. You can see it, and you go to Walmart, you go to the grocery store, you go to any place at all, and you will see stuff on a shelf. And that that basically, for a company's point of view, that's inventory. If you go to the warehouse in, in your particular operation, that's inventory. It's available for sale. So it's stuff that someone can come buy. But we also have another type of inventory called raw materials inventory. That's the stuff that you're going to use. You go along. That's the two by four that you have in the shed so that you can make stuff with. You got to have a certain degree of that. So it, it's available for sale, but you're going to do something with it before you sell it. Okay. So inventory basically is stuff that you're going to put out the door one way or the other. You're going to do something with it or you're just going to sell it raw. Bottom line is, you're going to get rid of it. It's not something that's going to stay in your place of work all the time. The thing is, though, as I say that, that's true. You will go through that. You're going to sell those circuit breakers. You're going to sell the two by four as probably a shed or whatever. But the thing is, then you're going to replace it. So theoretically, you're going to change over your inventory, but you're still going to have inventory. Like how often do you go into the grocery store and there's no grocery on the shelves, right? The inventory is always present in your store. That's money that you have tied up because you have it there in the store. But inventory is critical because that's what you make your money on. You, you sell inventory, and that is the basis on which you generate revenue. So it's critical, and it's what's considered a current asset. If you recall back to our financial unit, we said, okay, assets are stuff you own that you use to make money, Okay. Current assets are things that you own that you use to make money that you're going to get rid of or 
can value in one year, meaning that they're pretty liquid or they're close to cash. So inventory where it turns over, we assume that, yeah, it's going to turn to cash for us in within a year. Because inventory tends to be always moving, flowing out the door or people coming and buying it, or you're using up the two by four or these sorts of things, because inventory is always moving and because it's expensive, meaning that you've got lots of two by four or lots of circuit breakers or these sorts of things, you got to keep track of it. And that's a big challenge. Keeping track of stuff that's moving is very hard. You know, how much is going out today? How much went out yesterday? How much is there on the shelf? These sorts of things. It's not as simple as something as static. When you look at that truck you got out there and you say, okay, that delivery truck is going to be the same delivery truck today as it was tomorrow. There it is right there. I can look at that asset and say, yeah, that that's the truck. It, it's depreciating, no doubt, but that's the truck. Your inventory is always changing. It's, it's a kind of a, a fluid thing. So the primary objective of inventory is really to ensure that you got stuff that your customer needs when the customer needs it. So you can put your hand on and say, here it is. Here's the circuit breaker. Here it is. Here's the, the, the garage, the pre-assembled garage that I, I build in my workshop. So you want to meet the customer's needs quickly. And that helps in terms of this issue that we talked about last week, customer service, right? A customer don't want to wait six weeks for something. The customer would surely like it to be now, ideally now. So stocking too much inventory will ensure that you got that stuff there for the customer. No doubt about it. The customer comes in and looks for it. You got it because you got lots and lots of inventory. Challenge is you're going to pay for that because that inventory is going to sit there a while. You have to finance it. It also might go obsolete. If you're selling circuit breakers, for example, that a new type of circuit breaker comes out, the type that you have in stock might never sell. They'll just It's what's called dead inventory, and, and you're going to have to suck up the cost of that. You also have to finance the inventory. And the inventory, as I say, you know, you do the math on it. You say, okay, a circuit breaker costs me $20. I buy it. I put it on the shelf. Now, I, I just don't have one. I got 100. Oh, that's really 20 times 100. So I got a couple thousand dollars worth of circuit breakers. Yeah. Okay. That's neat. Now, I got to pay for that. And I'm borrowing money to pay for it. Uh, or the money can't be used for something else because it's using to pay for those circuit breakers. So there's an inherent cost in inventory. It gets expensive. So we need to find that magic balance. We want to service the customer, but not drive us into bankruptcy by holding so much inventory that we're paying so much for stuff that we're not even using or that really we can't turn to dollars easily. So inventory management is a key thing for all businesses because all businesses have some element of inventory, as I say. And, and we got to think about, you know, what is the cost of inventory? Where does it come from? But what are the ingredients that make that cost? Well, these costs are going to include like the price of it. Well, how much you buy it for? The invoice price. So you think, okay, I can get it at a deal. Maybe you can. Maybe you can get it at a less price than I can get it because you're a wholesaler, right? But you still have to pay for it. It still has a cost. And that invoice price, less any discounts, whatever the net price that you had to pay, you have to pay that for an inventory. You also have to pay for transportation. you got to ship it to yourself. You might have to pay the shipping on it. Someone's paying the shipping. might be you. Otherwise, it's built into the price of the item. Storage costs. Now, certain things you, know, you can put out in the cold. Let's assume you're in Labrador and it's minus 40. You can't go leaving stuff in minus 40 and expect it to survive, particularly if it's stuff that's a little bit fragile or stuff that will freeze or stuff that will potentially be damaged by the cold dampness. So you need to heat your storage area. That costs money. Import duties. If you're bringing stuff into Canada, for example, you're ordering it from Timbuktu, comes in here, there could be some duties on it. The exchange rate, the Canadian dollar versus US dollar, these sorts of things, all that's going to get built into the price of your inventory. And insurance gets price, pricey. You know, you, you've got to buy insurance on all that inventory. And uh, it's costing you $500,000, $2,000 a year. All of those things go to add in to say, this is how much it costs to keep that storage room full. And you have to make sure you make enough money on your product when you sell it to pay for that cost.
okay? So the, the cost of the item, there's more cost to you than just the cost of the item. So if we look at inventory management too, we've also got, where do we get this stuff to? You know, it's one thing to say, okay, I recognize that it has a certain cost. Where do I even get it to start with? Well, you gotta be able to source your inventory and every person or every business will have different sources of inventory. But it's important that you find good sources of inventory. You need people that, or you need a source of inventory that you can get good credit from, let's say, or good uh, agreements on terms of pricing. Uh, you need to be able to get it when you need it. So you don't want to be waiting a long time. So they got to be able to provide it to you. They got to have a good warranty or exchange program. They, you know, they got to offer you a lot of things. So product sourcing is one of the basic items that you need to consider and involves finding the right products that you need in your business. So for manufacturers, contractors, retailers, effective product sourcing will play a key role in the success of your business. You know, you're making your profit on the difference between what you pay for and what you sell it for. So, you know, that's that's a good chink, chunk of your expenses. Inventory is a good chunk of your expenses and certainly it will have an impact on your ability to make profit. There's no shortage of suppliers for stuff. You know, you can find lots of suppliers out there for given products. And probably the problem is more to do with that there's too many suppliers as opposed to not enough. So you gotta be able to find the right supplier and that's the challenge is how do you know what is the right supplier? Let's say for example, you're buying respirators here. The general N95 mask that we've become so familiar with. Where in the heck would you get that? Well, 3M sells it, but would you buy it directly from 3M or would you buy it through a retailer, a wholesaler? You know, where would you get that stuff? So you need to be able to ask yourself, where can I get that to? And what would give me the best combination of availability, pricing, delivery, all of these factors? You've got to consider that. So in order to be able to answer those questions, you really need to go through this little process here in your mind of planning out where you're going to source your information. So the very first thing you need to do is find all of your potential suppliers. So, you know, it, you're not going to generate a complete list, but you need to look and find out where and who sells this stuff. So this step is really a search process. This is a lot of seat work here. Um, before searching suppliers, you need to seek a good understanding of what each of those suppliers are gonna offer you in terms of your requirements. So you might need it delivered to your door. You might need it delivered within a week. You might need it any number of factors. So it really depends on what you're buying, right? What's the size of the order? How, how big is it? If you're a really small order, people, some companies only sell large orders. They may not sell in the quantities that you want to buy. Uh, will you carry the inventory or will you buy it as you need it? So you're making the decision of if it can be shipped really quickly, why would I keep it in the inventory? If I, if I can get it overnight, I don't need to keep it in the inventory, particularly if the price is right. Uh, how close do the potential suppliers need to be? So certain products work on proximity. You know, you need, uh, for example, if you're selling eggs, you're not going to be wanting to bring eggs from halfway around the world. They're not going to last. So you need to be pretty close. Uh, how efficient is the supplier order processing? Some suppliers are awful. You do an order, you might get in six weeks, might get in three weeks, might get it next week, you might get it tomorrow. It's almost as even. It's almost worse when they they're inconsistent. Meaning that I ordered last time and it took a week, or this time it took six weeks. That could throw you off altogether. So consistency is as important as timeliness. Uh, what's the available shipping options? Sometimes you might need to get stuff flown in, particularly in Newfoundland. You know, you you're you're a ways away, or even in Labrador. You know, you. You can't afford, like for example, let's let's say we're a R and R company, and you need a a piece of equipment that's critical to the processing operation. Well, every hour you're shut down costs you a lot of money. So the shipping cost is really irrelevant because no matter how much it costs to ship it, when you're down, you're not making any money whatsoever. So the cost of not operating far exceeds the cost of shipping. So you got to consider 
you know, what are our shipping options? How much does it cost? What level of support do you expect from the supplier? The supplier, for example, can provide information, product support, these sorts of things. Are they doing that? Can they do that? You're, you should consider that in terms of the purchasing process. And the payment terms. Obviously, you're going to look for favorable terms. You want to get it paid. You'd like it to stretch out to 90 days before you have to pay for it. Again, it's a way that you finance your business, and that can be very helpful to you looking at the terms that you have on a, on a particular piece of inventory. So once you've got that criteria laid out, and you've answered those basic questions, then you can actually go seek the potential suppliers. And you're going to make initial contact with them. You're going to ask some questions regarding what you laid out. Can they provide it quickly? Can they give you 90 days finance? It can't, you know, these sorts of things. From there, instead of doing a big order, you should ask for some samples. You know, if, if they're producing products, is this a product that you really can use? Is it the sort of thing that you want? And most products will be available in some sort of a sample form. So for non-standard products or products that have unique characteristics, before you place the order, ask for evaluation samples. Samples give you an opportunity to try, see, smell, touch it beforehand. So ordering samples also gives you an opportunity to check the supplier's ability to take and fulfill the, the order. You know, if you, they can't send you a sample, they probably can't send you the product very easily. So that will help. The fourth thing is order the first order on the small side. You don't want to be ordering a huge order and be disappointed, right? So better order on the small side. So once you feel you've narrowed down potential suppliers, place your first order, make it small. Um, you know, if the, supplier, if the supplier just can't provide it and you find that that's not working, uh, is not a great loss. So you make your decision regarding future orders on the basis of what you found out on the very first order. So you, then you can upsize it. And the fifth one, uh, the, and this again uh, goes back to what we talked about last week, building that relationship. This mutual trust between you and your supplier is very important. And if you can create a good relationship with your supplier, it will give you some breathing room in terms of order time, pricing, all kinds of uh, after sales service. If you know them, you have a degree of trust that allows you some comfort in terms of when you buy product. And that helps overall in terms of the inventory situation. Now, regardless if you're selling eggs, steel, two by four, whatever, these same basic five principles will hold. And where do you get the information? Where can you find these people? Well, thankfully now we have the internet and the internet is a very good tool for coming up with potential suppliers. And every supplier who's worth their salt is online. So, you can search up supply companies simply Googling it. It's just a matter of making sure that you put in the right parameters. So, for example, it's one thing to, let's assume you're looking for drills, okay? You're a, you're a, manufa you're a manufacturer or a retailer is selling electric drills. Well, depending on the types of drills that you're looking for, what you're looking for, you know, how you search can make a big difference what you get back. Uh, if you search, for example, DeWalt cordless drills, you're really sort searching three basic things. You want the DeWalt brand name, you want cordless, meaning that it's battery powered, and you want to drill. So three basic things. It narrows. It's a pretty narrow uh, focus. So those three words are very specific, and it'll give you that specific type of drill. If you want a saw or drill, you can simply search for saws or drills. So it will search pages for drills, and it'll search pages for saws, and if you want something really specific, like a DeWalt 18 volt battery, you type that into the search bar and it will show you that. Normally in, in the world, since this last five years, Amazon is the largest retailer in the world. Amazon will certainly provide you uh, some ideas for pricing. Uh, but Amazon is mainly what I would call retail as opposed to wholesale. You want to buy in volume. You got to think about who is it supplying the product? Are they a, a retailer? Selling one oils, or are they set up for for a distribution of um, um, after uh, a resell uh, reselling type situation, a wholesale type operator? 
So wholesale type operators, there are lots of examples out on the internet for those, including these right here. There's lots of what we call online directories. Years ago, there used to be books that you could get that were six inches thick that would you could use as directories on where to find potential suppliers. These directories have all gone online now, and there's a couple or three big ones. Worldwide Brands is probably the biggest one. It's a wholesale directory. They used to have a giant book. Now it's online. You can go to that, and you can see in their website that basically they provide they provide all kinds of products out there uh, to uh, to stores to sell. And a uh, drop shipper is just someone who sends the product right to you. So. There's also wholesale to be, uh, which is uh, an ex another example of a, a a site that sells wholesale products, and Thomas Net is another one of those, and they can point you to wholesalers who provide online products. So there's lots and lots of examples out there, and again, a quick Google search, you can find these. You know, it doesn't need to be these necessarily, but they're all over the internet. You can find this stuff within a few minutes. Now the question is. Do you want your product to be a locally sourced or are you concerned if that's the case or do you want it to be uh, nationally sourced or internationally sourced? Really depends on the product, uh, really depends on the product. And those are all the factors that you need to consider depending on what you are putting in place. If you're more local serviced and if you're more, I'll call it more sophisticated business, uh, the very simple, a uh, social media site called LinkedIn. Uh, I, I believe that every business should be on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is like Facebook for professionals. LinkedIn uh, is a tool that allows you to not only uh, put information there about yourself, so you see it's very much set up like Facebook. It looks almost identical. But LinkedIn allows you and your company to network. So you got a My Network, for example, uh, of people in your industry so you can link up like friends on Facebook but you can also find jobs and other companies there so for example once you find one of these companies you can you can link up with them and as a result uh, communicate with them so it, it gets you into the front office of that company and the same holds for true it gets them in the front office of your company so it's a really good tool that has become more popular and more prominent out there for businesses dealing with other businesses or people in business, people representing businesses dealing with other businesses. And the good thing with LinkedIn too is it not only talks about personal stuff like Facebook does, but it will, you can link up to various companies or organizations and you'll be in their feed. So when they send out information, you will be able to access it. So it's like a, a, a good hub network of finding companies, fellow companies, fellow, fellow uh, retailers, fellow trades people who are doing the exact same thing that you're doing in it. It gives you a, it gives you a good handle on that sort of thing. And if you're looking for jobs or you're, you have certain skills you want to sell, it's a great place to network to do that. The old traditional, you, you can't go wrong too with the old traditional trade show. The old conditional trade show is very much alive. Uh, the past few years, it's been tripping because of COVID. But I do notice, and if, if you follow any of this stuff at all, you'll see that there's all kinds of trade shows uh, out there right now uh, all over the world dealing with anything whatsoever. And it allows people to physically come together and find one another. So it's a, it's a real honest to goodness. So suppliers are always there. Uh, companies are always there that are in the trade that you're in. And you can certainly communicate with one another. So trade shows, traditional approach, and despite the fact that traditional trade shows have been in decline in recent years, these venues still remain important resources. And that's where you make uh, those critical relationship connections. Uh, they allow buyers and sellers to talk firsthand. It's face-to-face. It's -face. And it provides a relationship-building opportunity. So those are the key advantages of trade shows. Las Vegas, this picture was taken in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, every year they host hundreds and hundreds of trade shows. And it seems to be a popular place for the mining companies. 
you uh, whenever you get that inventory, you, you make those connections. It's also good to consider, should I just have a single source of supply or should I have multiple sources of supply? You know, this is a little bit like dating. Do I have one girlfriend or several? But the fact is that if you want to create a good relationship, it's good to have one single source of supply that you can, can develop. No doubt about it. That's a benefit. The problem is, is if that's your only source of supply, you are at their whim. So if they chose to shut down, they chose to get out of that business, they chose to sell, they chose to do anything that you have no control over, again, that source of supply is what you're, everything, it's going to impact you. So a lot of, a lot of people will argue that you should have multiple sources of supply, okay? Um, and... So when sourcing products, you need to consider the importance of having a solid supply line. It's usual, it's not unusual to uh, for business to have several sources of supply. Multiplier, multiple uh, supplier situation can be advantageous because, well, it could potentially give you better prices. Again, never, you know, the relationship is important, but you've got to be careful that you're not paying too much for something. Uh, better security supply whenever you have a backup source of supply, it's important. And it allows for quality control when there's more than one supplier, there's a bit of competition there. So one is going to try to outdo the other, considering that, you know, they want to continue business with you. In terms of managing this inventory too, we also got to consider how we best manage inventory. So if we think of inventory in its raw form, the raw material, uh, that's the stuff that nothing's been done with. That's the raw two by four out in the shed or raw pile of sand or raw iron ore. This is a raw stuff. It's not as valuable as a finished product, but it's still inventory. The work in progress, that's stuff that's almost done. So if you're building sheds and you got a halfway through one, that's, that's a work in progress or a partially processed item. If you're building cars, it's the cars that are on the assembly line. And then we got finished goods. These are the end products that you're actually relying to sell on. That's the most valuable form, right? So it goes from the least valuable form, which is raw material through work in progress to the finished goods. Now, finished goods inventory is your most valuable. It's the stuff that you're trading. It is the one you want to be careful with. We also have another form of inventory of maintenance, repair, and operating supplies. This is just stuff that you need to require in order to get that inventory into a usable shape. Uh, could be considered a shelving that it's on, for example. Okay, so those inventories that you have, be it raw material, work in progress, or, or finished goods, ensure that you got a good continuity of supply. It's a hedge against price increases. It's always good to have. Inventory, particularly if prices go up, especially if you're a wood, a carpenter person, you know, that two by four was really expensive during COVID. Price of it's coming down, but it's still really expensive. A lot, we saw a lot of fluctuations. Uh, meets unexpected variations in customer demand. Someone comes in, wants 10 sheds, you need a lot of wood. All of a sudden, you got an inventory, you can do it. Safeguards against price changes, smooths out variations in supply. Some, if supply gets held up, for example, you still have some. Uh, takes advantage of quantity discounts. The more you buy, usually the cost per unit will drop if you order larger sizes. And it saves on your transportation costs when you buy larger amounts. Usually the cost per unit drops. You can spread that cost over a larger number of units. And uh, it contributes to a happier customer. No doubt about it. We got to we got to consider that, but you know you have to make a judgment, and this judgment, uh, I just give you an example, mathematical, you know, puts real numbers on this judgment of I need inventory and I need lots of supply to keep customers happy, but it comes at a cost. Let's assume that you're holding inventory, right? You say, okay, look, I need to hold a hundred thousand dollars worth of inventory, so you got a hundred thousand dollars tied up right off the bat, okay? And uh, let's assume that. Uh, you go out and you make an order for that five hundred uh, those that hundred thousand dollars for the inventory. You do one order. That order will cost you five hundred dollars to get it shipped or whatever. Let's assume these are hypothetical numbers. 
That inventory, $100,000, you're borrowing money to put that there. And let's assume you're borrowing money at 5%. So every year that inventory is costing you $5,000 in interest right off the bat. Then you got to insure it. Let's assume that it's $500 a year to insure it. Then you got to store it in a heated space. And let's assume that heated space is costing you $9,500 a year. So the total cost of holding inventory for this particular example is $14,500. That's expensive. Now you say, well, okay, that's, that's one option. I can have a big shed that I put stuff in and that sort of thing. But let's assume I don't want a big shed. No, I want to order stuff in as I'm about to use it. Okay, I'm just going to go on an order by order basis. So I'll do, let's say, 30 orders a year as opposed to a big shed of inventory. I'll, I'll do 30 orders a year. And let's assume each order costs $500 as it was in the first case. Well, 30 orders at $500 each is $15,000. Either way, there's a cost. The cost of ordering was $15,000. The cost of storing was $14,500. Very close. So our job is to do that analysis. When we have, when we have a, a business and we, we're doing something, we should always keep in our mind, okay, let's always do that analysis. Now, let's say, what's the cost of holding the inventory? What's the cost of bringing stuff in? And you want to find that sweet spot. And that sweet spot... I'll just move over here to show the graphic. The sweet spot weighs out the costs of ordering. And you see, you know, if, if for example, you do many orders, many orders is going to cost you more, but individual cost per order drops. And then we got holding costs. The more, hold, the more you hold, the higher the cost. So the intersection of the two will give you your lowest total cost. So you need to be able to find that spot in your numbers when you do the math on it is that i need to find that balance between ordering and storing that is the most or least expensive most beneficial price for you and that's very important that you do that kind of analysis before you go buying great gobs of inventory or doing great numbers of orders you need to weigh out what the two are so what it ultimately comes down to is simply managing inventory. You need to give it a lot of thought. It's an expensive proposition for you to have. You got to think about incoming and incoming record keeping. If you're buying inventory and you got it in your place, you need to make sure that you're keeping track of it because some of that stuff can be very expensive. You got to make sure to correct information when you order stuff. And you say you got it in place and you put it in your computer, you got to make sure that information is correct. It's, it's pointless to have a system for keeping track of your inventory if it, the system doesn't mean anything or doesn't really represent reality. Uh, the stock room's got to be organized. This is a problem. Uh, we've got a problem here at the town. You know, how do you keep track of stock of inventory? And the town has lots of inventory of pipes and valves and um, tractor parts and these sorts of things. A lot of expensive stuff. Keeping track of it knowing we have it in stock, knowing it's available, that's a bit of a challenge. So uh, the idea of keeping a stock room organized, not only physically organized, but organized in some sort of a computer or some sort of a, a, a maintenance system to know what you have, it's important. Uh, storage units, usually if you're making standard products, such as two by four, for example, is a standard product. If you have a, a shelf that's X wide, you know that you can put X number of pieces of two by four, on that shelf. So it actually will aid in the counting of how much you have if your shelving units are the size and you know how much you can put on the shelf at a given time. And also it helps that the storage units are in the right location. You don't want to be storing stuff that you got to cart it. There's an old argument that says a forklift is the biggest waste of money a company can ever have. Because what a forklift does is it takes a product from here, does nothing with it, and moves it to here. So you, you paid to move it, but you've done no value at it with it. So you want to minimize the amount of storage that you need, uh, you know, storage shelf versus where you actually put the product. So where the storage is needs to be in the assembly process in a proper format. You need to have a good warehouse staff. If your business is big enough, someone has to keep track of that. That could be you. You just need to be aware of how to keep track of the stuff in the stock room. And probably the most important one, especially in today's world, is use technology. There's a lot of technology available, everything from spreadsheets to taking, you can uh, you can buy, you can get apps for your phone now where you can take a picture of the product, it'll count how many pieces are there on the shelf for you automatically. So these, these things are pretty common. Um, barcoding, you're familiar with barcoding because 
every product you buy has a barcode on it, so an electronic scan. Uh, but a new thing is something called RFID. Now, if you have a new car and you have a, a set of keys that the car automatically opens, you get close to it, or we got a push button start, that's RFID, uh, radio frequency identification tags. And all that is is a little tag that's built into the product that sends a message out to the reader to say, this is what I am. So it basically says, I'm a, a 24 inch um, uh, butterfly valve. Okay. That's, uh, and it will keep track of inventory based on just putting the scanner next or close to the item. So effectively, it will t- talk to the computer by itself. And you'll see if you go into Walmart or one of these larger stores, or Sobeys, you'll see these things being used in their inventory management control. We got to have a safety stock too. That's another thing. It's all good stock to say, okay, let's minimize the amount of inventory, but you got to use some common sense. How much do you need to cover up problems that you can have suppliers problems, you can have lead time problems, you can have material uncertainty problems, pricing. Make sure you consider that with regards to how much inventory you should keep. So those are the basic elements of inventory management that you really need to consider. What I've asked you to do in the discussion, the first discussion post, is just think about what are the top five inventory items in your place of work? Okay. And how much do you really stock? So all of us have some element of inventory and no matter where we work, I just want you to take a look at it tomorrow or this week to say, how much is there? How much is it? How much does it just add it up in terms of your head and how much of value it is? And if you were to think about those items, what are some potential suppliers for those items? Take a look out there and see where you can actually source that particular product that you look at. And um, how much inventory would you stock? Do you think that the inventory is proper in your place of work? Is it is it something sensible? And uh, what are some of the potential costs that you would consider in the storage? That's that's basically the question. Just to get you to think about what what we've talked about.